Hi, I'm Conrad Marshall, and from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Good Weekend Talks, a magazine for your ears featuring in-depth conversations with fascinating people from sport and politics, science and culture, business and beyond. Every week you can download new episodes in which top journalists from across our newsrooms take a deep dive into the definitive stories of the day. In this episode, we talk with best-selling author Matthew Riley. The prolific writer of short stories and novels has sold more than 7 million books worldwide, but kicked off his career with a self-published novel. Today, he talks about life in LA, why he writes what he writes, how much of him lives within his characters, and how he recently co-wrote and directed the Netflix film Interceptor. And hosting this discussion, including a chat about Riley's latest book, Mr Einstein's Secretary, and the research and interest in physics that it demanded, is the books editor of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, Jason Steger. Thanks, Conrad, for that. And Matthew Riley, welcome to the Good Weekend podcast. Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me. By my calculations, your new book, Mr Einstein's Secretary, is your 21st novel, not counting novellas and short stories, obviously. But it's only, I think, the second historical novel after the tournament? Yes, I think that's, I think that's right. It's, it's either 20 or 21. I think it depends if you count Hell Island in there. Yeah. <laughs> but Mr Einstein's secretary is a very, very big subject because fundamentally it's the first half of the 20th century uh, pretty well that you're covering with big characters um, ranging from obviously Albert Einstein, Adolf Hitler... It's a really, really action-packed novel. But tell me about the starting point of it, because the heroine, Hannah Fisher, is Albert Einstein's secretary. Tell me about the start of it. I'm always looking to do something that challenges me, something new. And uh, ever since, you know, I started writing books, you know, back in, well, iStation was published in 1998, so I've been doing this for 25 years Every book has to be better than the one before it. And some of them are a little better and some like this one, I think, are a lot better. And with Einstein's secretary, I wanted to do an epic. I wanted to do something that spanned, you know, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And it's that first half of the 20th century. Uh, As we get the First World War ending, the 20s, the 30s and World War II, I really wanted to get a young woman from Germany, this is Hannah, uh, who's gifted at physics and grew up as the neighbour of Einstein. And just as she's about to graduate high school and go and live her dream studying physics, tragedy strikes, and she's shipped off to America and sent to secretary school. So this is a woman who is very, very overqualified to be a secretary in 1920. And it was an avenue, a vehicle through which I could look at those years of the 20th century and have her as this fly-on-the-wall observer to these great moments. And that's where it started. But she is also um, a very capable action hero, isn't she? This is, uh, you would say this is uh, uh, a feature of nearly all of my books. The the hero or heroine is always capable. Um, But, yeah, to, to your original question, this is actually, yeah, the second sort of historical work I've done, the tournament being the first, and um, I love that stuff. I mean, the great thing about historical novels is you have the points that are known in history mm. and then there's, it's like looking, somebody's made this analogy before, you know, it's like looking at down on a valley that's filled with mist, but there are peaks that are poking out above the mist and those peaks are the historically known facts. Yeah. But all the misty bits are where you go as a novelist to fill in And that's where you have your fun, isn't it? Absolutely. I'd I'd agree with that completely. I've often said that, um, and I did this with the tournament, um, you know, we know where Einstein was and when, Mm -hmm. but we don't know what was said inside those buildings. We know when he was at Princeton. We know when he was at Caltech. We don't know what was said Mm. in those rooms. And and that's what I did with the tournament and that's what I look to do with, with Mr Einstein's secretary, take us into into the rooms of, as you say, those peaks of history that that we can see above the mist. Mm -hmm. And so have you got a good grasp of physics, tackling, uh, writing about Einstein, um, and and you have a very succinct 
a definition of the theory of relativity. Uh, how's your physics? Were you good at it at school? You know, I wished I was good at physics, but I was not. Uh, it, it wasn't meant to be in high school. <laughs> and so I've, I've often read sort of more popular science books on physics uh, to know enough and that's where, yeah, I, I know enough about it, just as I know enough about chess to have written about that in the tournament. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, there's a moment in, in Einstein where we discuss travelling at the speed of light for a 1,000 years mm -hmm. and that you would actually travel for a little over a 1,000 years. That's the sort of stuff that I have read about. I can understand the result. But how you get to that result, <laughs> no, that's, that's beyond me. Um, it's a funny thing as a novelist. As a novelist, you have to become this, you know, jack of all trades and master of none, but you yes. have to be able to put it into a compelling story. Yes. And you have to run the risk of some super expert out there writing you a stern email and saying, I read your book, Mr. Riley, and you got <laughs> this wrong. And if you can please hundreds of thousands of people and get one email, I can live with those uh, numbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the um, thousand, the travelling at that speed of light for a thousand years, comes in at a crucial moment. No spoilers, mm. but yeah, okay. I accepted that the answer to the to the question. I accepted the answer to the question, but I have no idea about getting from one point to the other. I mean, it's it befuddled it, me. It completely. is correct. It is correct. It is correct. And, and as as a storyteller. <laughs> It's one of those things that when you first encounter this piece of information in the novel, it's such a startling and counterintuitive piece of information mm. that when it comes back, people will remember it. Mm. And that, as a storyteller, that's what you're always looking for, things that people will remember. But you're dealing also, in addition to the physics, you're dealing with a lot of the political history of the 20th century, the, the mm. depression, uh, prohibition in America, uh, the huge yeah. rise of inflation in Germany, and, of course, the Second World War. Now, that also involves, presumably, a lot of research for you. Uh, an enormous amount of research. Um, gosh, I went and saw Oppenheimer you know, with my fingers crossed, making sure that we didn't cross over some of the same territory. And, <laughs> and when I saw Einstein in Oppenheimer, I'm going, oh, my God. And luckily <laughs> there, was no, uh, there was no overlap. It, there is an enormous amount of research, and I love that part of it. I was very much intrigued by the rise of the nationalist groups in Germany at the end of World War I, and I wanted the passage of time to show that these essentially racist thugs in 1919 become the police in 1933 when the Nazis take charge. Mm. And, and as you can see from the book, I'm, I find the Nazis were a, a bunch of ignorant thugs uh, and their, their regime only lasted 12 years. Thank goodness. Thank goodness, exactly, yeah. But I wanted the book, in, in the same way Dr Zhivago did, I wanted it, the passage of time to be a character in it and, and to see those characters mm, change mm. as time passes. Now, you've, you've written, obviously, a lot of action heroes in your time. Mm. And you've said somewhere along the way that they're all part of you. Yes. Yeah. So Hannah Fisher is a young woman uh, when we first yeah. meet her. She's a girl. And she's, we follow her uh, life well, throughout the book. So what part of you is in Hannah Fisher? You know, it's very strange. I've, <laughs> I've had this little run of female lead characters. Um, there was CJ and Great Sue of China, obviously Princess Bess in the tournament. Yep. There was Elsa Pataki's character yep. in my movie, Innocent. JJ, yeah. Um, I'm clearly sort of, um, I'm on a, a female lead bent lately. <laughs> I, I think it was, as with a lot of my books, the research precedes the book and then you do the research while you're doing the book. I had read about secretary schools mm -hmm. in the 20s. I think I'd seen a, like an advertisement for a secretary school or for a typewriter. And I was just shocked by the, the sexism of it, mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the secretary's job was to make her boss look good and that these were things for the, quote, female brain uh, to help the boss with his masculine brain, uh, you know, do the job. and so. I think the idea of the female lead really came up when I decided to have, you know, a secretary to all these 
significant male figures of the 20s, 30s and 40s. That's where it came from. And just as JJ in Interceptor and, and Bess in Tournament, she's the underdog. She mm. is the, in this hyper-masculine world, uh, she is the underdog. And I think readers and, and you know, moviegoers like to support an underdog. <laughs> well, she certainly, um, she must have been a very good secretary because she, she, she gets a job with all the sort of the big names, doesn't she? I mean, she, she spends time as Einstein's secretary, as Albert Speer's secretary, as Martin Bormann's secretary. She's a very intriguing character. Well, I, I suppose, you know, that you ask, you know, what part of me yeah. uh, is, is in her. I, I was very academic yeah. in in high school, I, I, I did very well in, in school. And when I came out of school, I went to law school and I was at a law firm for a very short time and it was completely unsuitable for me <laughs> because they, my bosses, these partners, would give me a task to do and I'd go off for the afternoon and do it and I'd bring it back and they'd look at me and they'd go, what? I said, I'm, I'm done. They said, you're done already? <laughs> and I said, well, you told me to go and do it, so I did it that I was working too fast. And this is, as, as my, my wife will tell you, when I sit down to write a book or a screenplay, it has 100% of my focus. I am at my computer with blinkers on. When I sit down to do something, I do it. And with Hannah, I think I just loved the idea of somebody who was so monumentally overqualified. <laughs> that. And, and when she gets her first job for Mr. Clay Bentley, this yep. industrialist from the 20s, he is the tough boss. He is the nonstop boss. And, again, what part of me is that? When I was in the third grade at, at school, I had the tough woman teacher, an older woman, and she was really, really tough. And my friend... He was in the class across the, the hall <laughs> with the young male. It was fourth grade. It was fourth grade, not third, fourth grade. He had the young male teacher who was cool and fun. And my parents said, I, I complained to my parents. I said, why do I have the hard teacher? And my parents said, you know, it's good to have the hard teacher. You know, you're going to learn. And I did. And, and a lot of that is in Hannah as well. That's true. That's very true. So it took you, um, I think, Five years to write this novel. Yes. Um, presumably you were also making Interceptor at the same time. I was. I was. A, uh, uh, Einstein's secretary, I started it and then I had to sort of step away and I think I did The Two Lost Mountains, mm -hmm. did a bit more of Einstein, did The One Impossible Labyrinth, then did a bit more of Einstein. So I was doing it on and off and it's sort of funny when you're writing this epic story, it helps to have these breaks in between because I could do the, the 19, sort of the teens in Germany and then the 20s and then take a break and then do the 30s and then take a break and then do World War II. <laughs> and Interceptor was, was in there, yes, in, in 20, pretty much all of 2021. Uh, and then there was a gap, uh, you know, between finishing Interceptor and, and it coming out because you, you deliver the movie to, to Netflix and then they take about three months to do all the subtitles and the dubbing. Yep. And then your movie comes out, and that is a, a whole experience unto itself. Mm. Um, that is a wild roller coaster ride. And in all those little gap periods, I just went back to Einstein. And, and the funny thing is, you know, your movie comes out, it burns brightly for a month. Uh, and then you're like, well, got to finish this book. That's so at, <laughs> back to and, work. And, and I think the time, honestly, Jason, the luxury I have as a professional author is the time. Yeah. I can sit, I can think, and I can devote the time. I can devote five years to writing this book on and off mm. and really make sure it's right. Um, you'd always wanted to uh, make a film, hadn't you? You always wanted to oh, direct yeah. a film because you've always said, you know, you write action movies but in books. Um, yeah. And action movies have always been your inspiration. So tell me about making interceptor it's uh, directing a film writing and directing a film obviously immensely different from yeah. writing a book where you're on your own this is a very collegiate experience how was it yeah it shocked my brother my brother my brother said you know you like to work by yourself what the hell are you doing working, yeah. <laughs> working with a crew of 100 people yeah it's sort of funny i i sometimes i find myself i i, I would be a strange study because 
95% of my life is introverted. I sit here in my office writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's a the 5% period like when I go on a book tour with, with Einstein or making Interceptor, you're dealing with people. And I loved working with these creative people. Mm-hmm. My crew on Interceptor, my producers were fantastic. Uh, Stu Beatty, Michael Bowge, and Matthew Street. And they brought, they introduced me to all these amazing Australian filmmaking crew. And I pretty much had arguably the best crew you could get in Australia for Interceptor. And, and I love creative people and I love just setting them loose. Mm-hmm. And I, I said to all of them, bring me your ideas. I want to say yes. If you go too far, I'll bring you back. Right. And the ideas they brought um, to sets, costumes, editing, audio. And then that's not even mentioning the actors, Elsa Pataki, Aaron Glenane, uh, Luke Bracey, all of the actors. I, I really sat down with them and I said to them, I wrote the character in two dimensions on the page. You're the one who's going to breathe life into it. It's your character. If mm. they said to me, oh, can I do this? I said, it's your character. And funnily enough, actors seem to like that. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, I loved it. I, I have a notebook this thick of notes I have kept from books about Spielberg, Kubrick, Lucas, Ridley Scott's audio commentaries, John McTiernan's audio commentaries, um, James Cameron's audio commentaries. Mm-hmm. Um, where do you learn to direct a feature film? Listen to the commentaries on DVDs. Uh, right. I was ready. I was, I've been waiting years to do this. I was <laughs> ready, damn it. <laughs> so tell me, um, were you nervous stepping onto the set on that first day? Um, oddly, no. I, I knew what I wanted. I had a clear image in my head of Interceptor. Um, mm-hmm. I'd written the movie. Uh, my friend Stu Beatty had, had rewritten it. He's a big shot screenwriter. He'd done collateral parts of the Caribbean. And so I felt very confident in what I wanted to get across. The only nervousness I had was, you know, breaking some unknown cultural bore of the set. Mm-hmm. Um, I had not spent a full day on a professional movie set when I did Interceptor. I, I had visited movie sets before, mm-hmm. but I'd never been on a set for a, as a professional for a full day. So I just didn't want to break any unwritten rule. Um, uh, beyond that, no, I, I knew exactly what I wanted. And on the first day, we finished at 2.30 in the afternoon because I said, hey, I got everything I need. And they looked at me and they said, yeah, said, yeah, we're done. <laughs> and they sent the crew home. And apparently it's a very good thing to send your crew home early on day one. They like you after oh, that. Oh, really? <laughs> so it's a, bit like, um, it's a bit like when you were at law school, getting the job done quickly. Yeah. If, if you focus and get it done and you know what you want to get done by the end of it. Mm. I mean, I, I did storyboards for Interceptor. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a little movie called Thor, which took all the storyboard artists away from me. So I drew 770 storyboards for Interceptor. And so my whole crew had this comic book that I had drawn, so they knew exactly what was in my head. And mm. there's, a, there's a, one of the signature shots from Interceptor has, has Elsa's character, just as the bad guys break out the guns, she's sort of framed like a gunslinger in the middle of this, this corridor as we zoom down the hallway to her. I had drawn that as one shot, two shots, three shots, getting closer and closer and yep. closer. They knew exactly what was in my head and... What you discover from feature film crews, they don't want a director who is wishy-washy. They don't want a director who is uncertain. If they see your commitment and they see the clarity of your vision, Mm -hmm. they will follow you like an army. And that's one of the big things I did. And Netflix were happy, though, with the outcome of Interceptor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, we, um, We ended up with 150 million hours viewed of that movie, which for a 90 minute movie is 100 million households watched it, which is now with Netflix, uh, they, they have their own calculations because, you know, in some households, four people watch it in others two and in others one. And as a conservative estimate, they, they say, you know, roughly one and a half people per household. Mm. So you can say 150 million people watched Interceptor. It was number one in 91 countries. Um, it's funny, actually, I, I go a little bit into the weeds for you. You'll dig this. Um, we asked Netflix before Interceptor came out, one of my producers asked an executive there, when will you know if this is a hit or not? And the producer said, in three days. 
Oh, that's putting and a bit of pressure on. <laughs> so the, the movie comes out and in three days it had racked up 36 million hours of viewing. And on the, after one day, I'm, I'm here at home in Los Angeles and I, I flick on my Netflix uh, on my iPad mm-hmm. and I'm hoping maybe Interceptor will sneak into the top ten. Maybe it'll be like number nine or something. It was number one. Oh, and I, I, call, I called Stuart Beatty and I said, can you just turn on your Netflix? Maybe it's because I was searching for my own movie that it's, it's humouring me. Can you see? <laughs> and he comes back, he texts me back, he goes, oh, my God. It was a uh, yeah. bit more uh, blue than that. He said, oh, my God, it's number one. And we get these, there are these sites you can, you can check and yeah. it was number one in 91 countries. So they knew in three days that it was going to be good. And then the Netflix algorithm kicks in, mm-hmm. puts it on more people's splash page. Of course. And so success begets success. Matthew, you're clearly somebody who's incredibly disciplined with your work. Mm. But let's go back to the very beginning. I mean, this is a story that you've, you've told umpteen times, but frankly, it never, it never <laughs> loses anything in, in, in no. the telling. Contest. Yes. You self-published it. Yes. And that was the first book. Tell us, please, about that experience and what happened when you self-published it. Yeah, so I, I wrote Contest, you know, during the first two years of my law degree. Mm-hmm. Um, felt pretty proud of myself, sent it to all the major publishers in Sydney who all rejected it. <laughs> um, and so I thought, well, you know, a good publisher will go to a bookstore. So I self-published Contest. I printed a 1,000 copies, um, took them to bookstores. You and know, you made it look like a real, like a- I did. I gave it a very glossy blockbuster thriller cover. Yep. Um, and it had like his electrifying thriller across the bottom, which I took from the cover of Jurassic Park, um, <laughs> uh, which is still possibly my favorite book. And into one of those bookstores that I got it into walked Kate Patterson, uh, who was the commissioning editor of Fiction at Macmillan. She bought it, read it. She rang up the number on the copyright page and asked to speak to me. And importantly, for anybody out there who wants to write a book, she said, what else are you working on? I don't want someone who writes one book. I want someone who writes two, three, or four books. And I had just started Ice Station. Mm-hmm. And it was on the basis of the first 50 pages of Ice Station that she signed me up. And, and as everybody knows, Ice Station was the first book Macmillan published. And it was quickly sold to many countries around the world, mm-hmm. especially the US mm-hmm. and the UK and Germany. And, and they re-released Contest a few books later. I did Ice Station Temple and then they did Contest uh, later. And I mean that's a that's a it is a wonderful it is a wonderful story. Contest I think has sold over a quarter of a million copies in Australia alone, and yeah. you've sold more than eight million books around the world. I think, and yeah. you published in twenty languages. But you always hoped that I mean they were the the books were were frequently optioned, weren't they, for film? But, yeah, but oh. nothing was actually made. Why why was that? Well, they're gigantically expensive. Yeah. I mean, even Interceptor, I had $13 million as a budget, which for an action movie is very small. Mm. I sold Ice Station to Paramount Pictures in 2001. They got a great screenplay done and the executive who bought it left the company to go and run Fox. And this is what happens in Hollywood. New executive comes in and he kills all the cubs of the previous lion. Uh, and right. if that's happened to me once, it's happened to me five times. I have optioned my books to Disney, Fox, Sony, Warner Brothers, um, all over Hollywood, and and none of them have been made. And, um, you know, you option them with the best of intentions and it can still happen. But that's, that is the movie business. And you've probably heard of some of your favourite books or sometimes somebody writes their first book and it gets picked up by the movie business very quickly. And then it enters what they call development hell. Mm-hmm. And this, this is what happens. Um, so I, I go into Hollywood with my eyes wide open. You kiss a few frogs in Hollywood. <laughs> and after you've been dealing with them for 20 years, hopefully you start to sort of figure out who the trustworthy ones are. You, you find out who are the ones who can really do something, who really want to make a movie, and those who don't. Mm. And, you know, I'm still learning. 
<laughs> but uh, I remember um, when, you know, early on in your career, you know, it was always a sort of assumed, not assumed, but teenage Boys loved your books, didn't they? And I remember, yeah. I remember one time bringing um, my son and one of his friends to to a session you did at the Melbourne Writers Festival. And what struck me was a how much they adore all adored you, and b just how generous yeah. you were in your in the way you dealt with them in the in the things that you did on the stage. You know, you actually brought brought props along and and showed them things yeah. and they absolutely absolutely adored. Uh, does do you still did you target teenage boys with it? was that your sort of readership or did you just find them? No, I I didn't target anybody. Yeah. I think it's probably I think it's testament to my authentic inner teenage boy <laughs> that that the books I'm writing the books that I want to read. I, Stephen King once said, every author looks at the books they're reading and says, I can do better than that. And I think he's correct. I looked at the books I was reading mm -hmm. as a 19, 20-year-old and I said, they can be bigger and they can be faster. And that's what I want to read. And the, the early books, especially the Ice Stations and yep. the Scarecrows and the Seven Ancient Wonders, they are absolutely boys' own adventure, what used to be called boys' own adventure yeah. stories. Yeah but they're fast mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they are designed to be unput downable, which is the kind of book I love to read. I love something which I just lose track of time and can't put down. And I think you can't be anything other than who you are. Yeah. And I think it's the authenticity. So I didn't set out to, you know, if you want to set out to make money as an author, you should write romance books. You should go <laughs> and write romance books, try and do what Daniel Steele does and, and do that. Yep. Um, but that's not what I enjoy reading and I would be spotted as a fake by romance readers mm -hmm. who are very sophisticated readers who know that genre well. But if you like action movies, if you like your Star Wars and your Marvel and your movies like The Matrix or Speed or Die Hard, then you're going to like Matthew Riley stuff because that's what I like. <laughs> and, and when I'm writing my books, I'm trying to make them better than yeah. all of those books and or movies. Yeah. So, no, I wasn't trying... In terms of dealing with um, giving something to, to people who come to a book signing or to an event at a writers' festival, I had a very key experience, which actually was repeated once. I went to a book signing when I was about 19 years old mm -hmm. and the author didn't even look up at me as he signed the book. Uh. And I was appalled. Mm -hmm. And I said, if I ever have anybody turn up to a book signing, I will look them in the eye they're not there to get a book signed. They're there to meet you. They're there to just say, I enjoy your stuff. And nowadays with, with phones, with camera phones, they want a selfie. Yeah, 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 of course. And so I'm always going to do that. As long as we can keep the line going, yep. I, will, I will give them every bit of time. Yeah. And it was because I saw that author who shall remain nameless and I thought that is, I saw that when they just ignore you, it's like, why are you even here? Yeah, that's right. You have to give something of yourself yeah. when you do an event like that and when you do a book signing. Yeah. I, I even had a guy come to a book signing in Brisbane and he was in tears as he got to the signing table. He had been very much struggling with his mental health and he was saying that the book, my books were giving him an escape. And I stood up, I gave him a hug and I said, listen, I'm probably going to be doing a book tour in a year or two. I want to see you here. And, and this guy was pretty distraught. God love him. Two years later, he came back. Oh. And he was a new guy. Oh, that's wonderful. And he was, he was fresh-faced and, and fit and healthy and mm. he said, I'm back. Yeah. And I remembered him. And you, you can affect people's lives. And I, that's, I, yeah, you've got to give something of yourself. And yeah. I will always do that and I can always sleep after a book signing, I go back to my hotel room and lie down in the dark and just recharge for the next day. <laughs> well, I still and if that's what it takes, that's yeah. what I'll do. I yeah. still remember that session in Melbourne. It was on a Sunday. It was dreadful weather. And uh, Jack, my son, and his friend Tom, who came along, they absolutely loved it. I mean, they, you know, they were in I'm seventh thrilled. heaven. Yeah. Seventh heaven. So good, um, you've, got a, you've got another book on the go at the moment. Yes. Can you yes. tell us anything about it? 
Uh, it's going to be another um, standalone. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll be a. Th- it's going to be a detective thriller. Oh. Um, so again, I. So I've. In, in, when I look at my career and look at the collected works, you know, there are two series. There's the Scarecrow series, yep. which started with Ice Station and has four and a half books. Um, Hell Island being half a book. Yep, yep. The Jack West series was Seven Ancient Wonders, which was seven six five four three two one. Um, I never set out to write seven books, but when you start counting down from seven to six to five, readers suddenly expect you to count all the way down to one. You've that's, locked yourself in. <laughs> I know. That's, that's learning experience. Um, <laughs> Once I finished the Jack West series, I did want to explore other things, and that's where Mr. Einstein's secretary yep. came from. Uh, and this one is to do a a detective thriller, but a detective thriller in a way that nobody's ever seen one before. So, mm. really enjoying it. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued. It's going to freak people. It's oh. going to freak people out. That's for sure. <laughs> is there is there one thing in your in your books that you always put in? You know, there's a, a Matthew Riley trademark, do you think? Oh, that's a good question. I, um, the first thing that springs to mind um, is the first line. Right. And I work very, very hard um, on the entry point mm-hmm. to every book. Mm-hmm. Where do you start? Where do you enter the story? And uh, I still remember um, the first line of Ice Station, you know, 25 years ago. Yeah. It's, you know, the, the slug line is, you know, Wilkes Ice Station in Antarctica. It had been three hours since they'd lost contact with the two divers. And that's your entry point. You're in this remote ice station, you're on the ice shelf, and they've lost contact with the divers. That first line of your book should make every reader go, Oh, that's interesting. Yep. What happens next? Yep. And so if there's something that is, is particular to what, you know, what we call a Matthew Riley book, I would say it's hopefully a first line that makes you go, oh, that's interesting. What happens next? First line of Mr. Einstein's secretary. Hannah's watching her own funeral. That's right. It, it gets you in immediately because you think, what is going on here? Is she dead? That's is right. she in heaven? Is she whatever? I was thinking, oh, we've gone supernatural. Um, That's right. Yeah. And, well, you find out. And I'm counting on that, that, that very thing that readers have read a lot of books and they might have seen that device before. And part of doing a good twist, no spoilers here, is obviously working on what people are used to. And, yeah, that opening line of Einstein is designed to make readers go, oh, she's looking at her own funeral and she's, she's lamenting how few people come. <laughs> and, and then after you're into that, then she's like, well, you know, so that, that, that is one of the uh, downsides of being a spy at certain times in your life. Yeah. And hopefully then the readers go, oh, that's interesting again. Yeah. And, and, that, and I will tell you, um, as you read the book, you know, a few pages in she's been interrogated. She has these three interrogations. and. When I first conceived the book, it actually began in one of the interrogations. Right. And I decided that wasn't the entry point. The entry point was the funeral. Yep. And, and so first lines, they're, they're a big deal to me. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Um, final question. You've been living in Los Angeles for eight years. Life's good in LA? Uh, I love it here. Yeah. I love it here. It was, it's been just the change that I needed. Yes. Uh, I can still happily write my books. I've still got my posters yep. behind me and got my little putting green <laughs> in my office here. And I am closer to the action movie yep. world. Yeah. And that is what I needed. Yep. I Even making Interceptor, we filmed it in Australia, but we used Netflix America's money yep. to, to bring the movie and film it in Australia. I, I couldn't have got that movie up and running uh, living in Sydney as I was, yeah. and I have found a new tribe here, and I have friends who are movie directors or action movie <laughs> writers, and, and again, that is that's been wonderful to to find my tribe. And I I recently remarried um, with with Kate Freeman, who came with me from Australia, um, and people have seen Kate, and and so yes, it, it's it's been wonderful, and I, I love it. I'm really sort of 
chasing all of my dreams. <laughs> Fantastic. Great to talk to you, Matthew. And congratulations on Mr. Einstein's secretary and on Interceptor. Thanks, Jason. Great to talk to you again. Good Weekend Talks is brought to you by the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Subscriptions power our newsrooms. To support independent journalism, search subscribe Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. And if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe, rate and comment wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of Good Weekend Talks is produced by Chi Wong. Technical assistance from Cormac Lally. Editing from Conrad Marshall. Tom McKendrick is head of audio. Ruby Schwartz is head of podcasting. And Katrina Strickland is the editor of Good Weekend. Good Weekend.